All right, what's going on, guys? Uh, as you can tell, I, I'm not Jason. Uh, Jason will be here in about two minutes, so don't click off just yet. And if you happen to be watching on YouTube in the past broadcast, I'll put a timestamp in the description or in the comments down below so you can skip to when we actually start getting into the details of the podcast. But uh, Jason's actually parking. He's running upstairs right now. So um, we should get him on here in about 30 seconds to a minute. But uh, yeah, hopefully it's having a good day. We're going to discuss CrossFit nutrition um, and how certain athletes finish at the CrossFit Games in 2020. There's a lot of controversy going on there. So we're going to dive into that today. So I'm super excited about that. And like I said, Jay will be on here in hopefully about 30 seconds to a minute. But in the meantime, just in case you aren't aware, I know a lot of you guys are watching this from the Nutrition Coaching Secrets group. Or if you're not watching it from there, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you join the Nutrition Coaching Secrets group. It's in the description below. There is a uh, there is a level one certification coming up. So if you haven't done that yet, definitely look into that. And I'm sure Jay can get you some more information or, or something. Um, but yeah, so we're going to dive into CrossFit nutrition. Also, if you guys have any questions as we go, since we're recording live, you guys can go ahead and comment down below. I'm not sure if we'll get to them. I'm not sure what Jay has in, in, in his, uh, his mind as far as what he wants to do with that. But uh, go ahead and let us know if you have any questions about CrossFit nutrition, the CrossFit games, whatever. And we will try to get to them. <laughs> it looks like we have 10 viewers here. So ho hopefully you're not too disappointed seeing me on here. If you don't know me by now, I love my cold brew. So I've got my second cup of cold brew for the day. And uh, yeah, let's see where I'm going to, I'm going to shoot Jason a text, see where he's at. But um, yeah, let's see. Let's see. What, what can I talk about to, to keep you guys entertained? Um, covered the topic for today. Covered. There's an L1 coming up. Again, if you're watching on YouTube, definitely be sure to join the Nutrition Coaching Secrets group. Hopefully, oh, he commented, he's coming. Okay, I'm gonna put this up on the screen right now so people realize. And again, if you're watching on YouTube, if you happen to be on YouTube, you're like, what the hell is going on right now? Why uh, Why is this random guy on the screen right now talking? Where the hell is Jason? Uh, as you can see on the screen, right there, he's coming. And I'll put a timestamp in the description below if you're watching the replay. So you can go ahead and just skip ahead there when we actually get into the material for today's podcast. So just want to give you guys a heads up. But yeah, if you don't know me, my name's Tommy. Not that you really care. Uh, I do a lot of the content marketing stuff for NCI as well. Uh, running the YouTube channel, the podcast, stuff like that. So if you have any questions about that sort of stuff, feel free to, to message me um, on here, on Facebook, on IG, wherever. Uh, happy to help with that sort of stuff. But Today, like I said a few minutes ago, we'll be diving into CrossFit nutrition, how to program correctly for that, some common mistakes, and clearly some mistakes were made in the CrossFit games this year, so we'll dive into that as well. Nice to meet you. I'm glad, I'm glad someone enjoys having me on here. I, that makes me feel slightly better about myself. Thanks for the, the little self-esteem boost there. Let's see. Jason must need to work on his running or something because he said he was running upstairs like a minute ago. He's got to work on his cardio. I'm trying to bail you out being stranded and waiting. I host my own podcast for like my nutrition stuff. I work on nutrition with basketball players or a lot of like college players, pro players, stuff like that. And it's like, if I, if I had a plan going into it, I would be uh, all good to go. But yeah, I wasn't I wasn't expecting uh, to be solo on this one for, for four minutes. So bear with me here, guys. Here he is. Okay. Oh, about time. Okay. I, I, I think I, I stalled for long enough. You stalled long enough, dude? Yeah. Yeah. I was kind of talking shit about you, but it's fine. Oh, well, that's fair. You're allowed to do that. When I'm late, it's uh, it, it can talk shit. Cool, cool. So, uh, awesome. what, what are we talking this. about? Did you tell everybody? Did you tell everybody about the level one that's coming up? Hold on, I'm just trying to adjust the lighting. So, I actually did. You'll be proud of me. So, everybody knows, next live level one, last live stream of the year is happening a week from Saturday. So, we got like ten days till this goes down. Um, 
So, uh, dude, I'm excited. Um, this is a topic that I think a lot of people want to know about. I've had way too many text messages asking me about certain individuals' performances at the CrossFit Games, um, what my thoughts were about the format in general. And so um, what a what a like full circle um, that we're having here because you know, really my, my initial claim to fame was nutrition for CrossFitters, right? Was um, a lot of people understood that I, I tell everybody, my big joke is I, I think I was the most hated CrossFit nutrition coach before I was the most loved. Um, and I think that the reason that I was the most hated is I came in with very radical ideas. I came in with truth and nobody was ready to accept the truth because everybody was still, um, you know, attached to the teat of CrossFit and paleo. And it was, um, you know, it, it was is a tough time because even myself, like, I'm not gonna lie, when I came into CrossFit in 2012 ish, um, I I remember seeing everybody talking about paleo, um, even like the the OGs like Kalipa, and I think that was the year like Garrett Fisher had like a really good finish shortly after that, and I remember messaging with him and. Um, you know, a lot of people reference paleo. And so even I, like where I was in my career, I questioned myself. I'm like, should I be looking at this paleo thing? And, um, you know, did some research and was like, all right, this is bullshit. Like, we've got to speak the truth. And so, um, you know, listen, first and foremost, man, like, let's just jump right in. CrossFit in and of itself from an energy system perspective is a glycolytic sport, period, the end. Um, you know, at, at its highest level, um, I think that, CrossFit athletes have a very strong aerobic base, but they have a very strong ability to really go deep in their anaerobic threshold as well. Um, and so when you look at the fuel that carries over to both of those, it's carbohydrate. It's not protein. It's not fats. It's carbohydrate, right? And, and we talk about this all the time in level one. Can you fuel aerobic work with fats? The answer is yes. You cannot fuel the aerobic threshold with fats. The aerobic threshold is fueled by carbohydrate. So as you approach aerobic threshold, you're, you're shifting into carbohydrate for energy storage, right? Now, you've never seen a CrossFitter, even in the most a aerobic of events, cross the finish line or finish the AMRAP and just simply walk away, right? What do you see? You see, you see people laying on the floor. You see people hands on heads, hands on hips. Um, sometimes you see vomit, uh, but you, you always see people that near that death mark. And and that death mark is indicative that they push threshold. And so if you're getting close to threshold, it is indisputable that you have to have carbohydrate. I don't understand why this is even a question, to be totally honest. And and then, you know, obviously the, the fuel debate comes in. Um, and I think this was like one of the first things I got was, uh, and, and, you know, one of my earliest influences was uh, Mike Castelli. And, you know, we were actually business partners at one time. And then James Fitzgerald. And, and James Fitzgerald was kind of like a food quality Nazi. And I, I remember um, somebody came into our forum and I, I was like, man, has anybody used If It Fits Your Macros with success in CrossFit? This is how old I've been. This is how long I've been in the game. And somebody was like, yeah, I eat ice cream every day before my workout. And I remember I was such a dickhead. I'm like, are you even good? Like, of course <laughs> you do. Like, you can do that. I'm like, but are you any good? And, and she was, uh, she actually went on to work for me, uh, <laughs> which is like, <laughs> Thing. Yeah. Um, and so she said, like, she's like, yeah, like, I'm not bad. And, and, you know, it was very traditional if it fits your macros approach. Like, I want ice cream every day. I want to have it pre-workout. It's, you know, my carbohydrates pre-workout. So um, I just, I didn't agree with really shitty foods being an emphasis of if, it's your, of if it fits your macros. And I still don't agree with that. So the, the real debate came when we introduced the notion that carbohydrates were essential not only to fuel, but to recovery. Um, and, and then it obviously became the types of carbohydrates, which we'll get into in just a second. Um, so when, when we look at CrossFit as a whole, right, we just acknowledge it's glycolytic activity. It requires carbohydrate. That's, that's indisputable. The, the second thing we have to look at, whether, whether you use it, like, what are you using CrossFit for? So whether you're using it for aesthetics, like, can you use it for fat loss? Absolutely. It, whether you're using it for performance, can you become a better athlete with CrossFit? Absolutely. I, I don't think there's a lot of people that are using it for longevity. Um, and, and we'll get into that in just a second. All right. So let's break it down per, uh, mode, you know, per goal set, so to speak, right? If you're using this for fat loss, 
first and foremost, you're not going to achieve fat loss in a calorie surplus. Cal like fat loss is achieved in a calorie deficit, period, the end, right? You have to expend more calories than you intake to achieve fat loss. And, and we know that to achieve fat loss and not weight loss, the composition of those calories matters. So your, your macros have to be in line, right? You need to be eating adequate amounts of protein. You need the correct ratios of protein sparing nutrients, i.e. carbs and fats. Um, really simple. But when we start to dig into being in a deficit, this is where things go sideways. Because by definition, being in a calorie deficit means that you are intentionally under recovering. This is not, we can't dispute this, right? Eating sub maintenance calories, even 300 to 500 calorie deficits, small calorie deficits, even there, you are intentionally under recovering. Now you're adding in one of the most intense training systems, right? Really in, in the world, because I think CrossFit programming is highly bastardized. And so I think that intensity um, has really been emphasized. Not, I don't think it fits in with the traditional CrossFit um, prescription, but I think today's, uh, because of the performance aspects in the games, I think that today's CrossFit protocols are very high intensity. Um, you start to see those border on excessive. So now we've got, we've got number one, we've got people under recovering by not eating enough. We've got number two, they're, they're really overreaching based on the intensity of their training modality. And then three, let's just remind you and, and everybody listening what Western culture is all about, right? We over-caffeinate, we undersleep, we overstress, we work too fucking much, uh, like we can't shut our brains off. We are already living in a state of an abundance of stress. So when you start to look at the stress response of individuals, we, we're starting with a cup that is 80 to 90% full. Now we're having a calorie deficit, which is adding another five to 10%. Now we're adding a training modality that's 20 to 30%. Now we're like 30% overfilled on stress. And remember the, the foundation of human change, the foundation of physical change is stress and adaptation. And when the stress becomes excessively abundant, adaptation does not happen. When stress becomes entirely too much, the adaptation you desire, i.e. fat loss, is not going to happen because what happens? Your body just needs to survive. Your body extrapolates that what is happening right now is going to happen for infinite amounts of time. It doesn't know that you only plan to diet for six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, 20 weeks, whatever it might be. It does not know that. You don't get to input that anywhere. Your body thinks this is a forever scenario. So if it thinks that it's going to be abundantly stressed and under recovered forever, what does it do? It starts preventing you from creating that stress, i.e. it shuts down its output and it starts to protect itself from not having enough, right? It starts to protect itself from the adaptation because if you're trying to lose fat and your body continues giving up fat, well, at some point you have no insulation for your organs. You have no ability to survive, thrive, or procreate, which is why we were put on this earth in the first place. We weren't put on this earth to snatch 300 pounds while having 4% body fat. Whether, whether we want Some to people think they are. Vain creatures, that's not why we were put on this earth, right? It's absolutely crazy that people still think that. So if we're, can we use CrossFit for fat loss? The answer is yes. I do not believe that people looking to use CrossFit as their training modality that are looking to achieve fat loss should be going five and six days a week. I think three days is probably sufficient for most people. Now, if you're a soccer mom and you're at home and you have no stress and no kids, or that, I guess you, you would have a kid if you're a soccer mom. If you're a housewife and you're at home and you have no stress, right? And you want to go to CrossFit every day because you don't get a lot of steps and you don't have a lot of like, you know sympathetic stress in your life. Sure. I think that could work. But if you're a Fortune 500 CEO and you got to get up at 5 a.m. to get to the 6 a.m. class before you go to an office where you're in meeting after meeting, stress after stress, not getting home till 8.30 at night, eating the local fast food on the way home, you know, even if it fits inside of your macros, only sleeping five hours a night, and you think CrossFit is the answer to, to your goals, it's not going to work. It's going to be that abundance of stress. It's going to shut you down, and you're going to end up with HPA access issues. It's non, it's, it's non disputable. I've watched it happen in thousands, thousands of people. Now, can we talk about CrossFit and performance? Does CrossFit yield athletic performance? The answer is yes, 
right? I actually believe it's one of the better training modalities. I think bodybuilders, right? And this is going to be, man, I could get flamed for this hard. I think bodybuilders should actually look at what CrossFit does because I think CrossFit, CrossFitters have some of the most developed physiques without even trying. When you look at like the roundness and the fullness of their muscle bellies, and this is somebody that's coming from the physique industry. You look at the fullness of their muscle bellies. Number one, they're always fueled because they don't care about being shredded all the time. So there's always carbohydrates in the cell pushing against the skin, right? Number two, they're doing a lot of volume. They are doing high volume in short amounts of time. Right. And, and so I think that if bodybuilders began looking at this as a training modality and understood, hey, wow, I could have higher levels of frequency with higher volumes of training and I actually ate carbohydrates, I might have more development. Right. And so I, I think that's actually why you've seen and I talk about this all the time. And in 2007, if you would have gone into a, a global gym and you asked a, a bodybuilder, um, you said the word AMRAP to them, they'd be like, get the fuck out of here, you CrossFitter. Whereas now, you see people all the time, they're like, I'm doing my AMRAP sets of, of squats. And it's like, oh, like you're doing that. Like, I, I actually think I saw yeah. Alex Hormozzi one time post a workout where it was like eight minutes of like doing rows and presses and like triceps press downs. And he just kept going for eight minutes. And, and listen, if you haven't seen Alex's physique, dude's fucking jacked. Like not only is he a really good marketer, homeboy is jacked and he's lean, right? And, and I don't think he's doing CrossFit. Um, but I do think he's borrowing from that training modality, or maybe it's just a function of time. Either way, it works, right? Yeah. So do I think you can use CrossFit for, for performance? Yes. Here's the kicker. You are not, you are not, you are not going to increase your performance if you're also trying to move towards fat loss, right? Let me say that one more time. You're not going to improve your CrossFit performance if you're also trying to create fat loss. It's just simply not gonna happen. You're not going to live in a deficit. Now here's the exception to that rule, right? I'll, I'll give an exception to my own rule. If, you've, if you have a very low training age or if you're just starting CrossFit, you can, you can create that. Now in level one- Do you think that's why so many people fall into that trap? That? Do you think that's why so many people fall into that trap of thinking, oh, I can do this, it's working, so then just keep Kind of going for this the is actually, this kind of thing. exactly why the paleo challenges took off and ultimately yeah. failed. Because if you think back to 2012, why did people like like what was the big thing in CrossFit gyms? Paleo challenges, right? Everyone did a fucking paleo challenge or they did a whole 30. And like I had so much success with that. And it's like, oh, really? Tell me more. Were you in your first eight months of CrossFit? Oh, I was. Oh, did you do it once? You had really good success, and all of a sudden, eight months later, you tried it again and you hit a fucking wall. Oh, actually, that's exactly what happened. Got it. There's an explanation for that. Because when you're shifting into a new training modality, your brain is what's adapting, right? Yeah. I, I was the king in my first month of CrossFit of finishing a 20-minute AMRAP in two minutes. Like, I was, I was better than anybody. Because two minutes, I blew my fucking wad, and I was done. Like, I had nothing left. I was like, watch this, motherfuckers. I'm going to get more rounds than everybody. And I just, like, I, I, shit, I shit the bet, like, routinely, <laughs> right? And, and I didn't know how to barbell snatch. It was like watching a fucking gorilla try to move something that it's never seen before. It was retarded. Um, you know, but I went to every CrossFit gym and people were like, oh, you're big and jacked and strong. And so this will be fun to watch you lift. And I just muscle snatched and muscle cleaned absolutely everything. Right. Um, and, and so it was, it was not pretty, but I, I too made a mistake of when I went into the CrossFit world, I was using bodybuilding dietary principles. So I wasn't having a lot of carbohydrates away from my training time. Um, now, in absence of carbohydrate and absence of fuel, I, I, I was able to breathe really good, which is why I prefer a semi-fasted training state for a lot of CrossFitters, right? My aerobic capacity was instantly higher, um, but I never had the fuel or recovery. And so when, when I got beyond that neurological adaptation phase and I started working with James Fitzgerald from OPT and, and I was training twice a day, dude, my recovery tanked. Um, there was a time when I went in the gym, no bullshit, man, this is a true story. You know me, I love to squat, right? You're, you're never going to have people around me squatting, putting serious weight on the bar and not have me participate because like that's my time to like show up, right? I, it's, I don't do a lot of things very well, but I squat really well and really heavy. <laughs> and, and I walked into a CrossFit gym, my PM programming had, had barbell squats to start. And I put the bar in the rack, you know, did a couple mobility drills to warm up and I put 135 on it. I did one rep, I racked it, and I walked out of the fucking gym. I was so tired, I was so drained, 
I had no motivation. I hadn't been sleeping. I just didn't want to do it. And, and there was that moment when I was like, all right, something's wrong. And I had to yeah. figure it all out. That was actually a very pivotal moment in me figuring all of these nutritional things out. I realized how much I had overextended, overreached, and ultimately damaged my HPA axis. And, and because of that, I actually believe I have what I call nervous system adaptation, but that's another podcast for another day. Um, so can you use CrossFit for performance? Yes. Do not use it for fat loss. You're not going to create performance living in a calorie deficit, period, the end. Um, can you use CrossFit for performance and fat loss together? The answer is yes, in a periodized fashion. Okay. And so this is kind of where the CrossFit season is not really our best friend. If you're a high level athlete, if you're a lower level athlete, it's not that bad. But I remember like when I first started coaching a lot of CrossFitters, I would get people and they would be like, okay, well, I'm going to do the open and then I want to get ripped for summer. And so what do they do? They come out of the five most intense weeks of the year. And then they're like, okay, now it's time to get ripped. And it's like, no, 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 motherfuckers. Now it's time to recover, right? Yeah. You just spent five weeks completely destroying yourself. Now it's time to recover. And so we would get to the end of March and everyone's like, oh, June's like eight weeks away. I got to get shredded. No, no, no. Eight weeks, you need to fucking recover. Then we can get shredded, right? And this is where a periodized model has to come into play. Because again, coming out of the open, you're already compromised, you're already overreached and likely overtrained. You're emptying the tank two to three times per week because everybody fucking repeats the workouts, right? Chances are you're not fueling adequately because very few people actually are. So now you're overreached, overtrained, overstressed, and now you want your body to give up body fat? As a reminder, getting leaner is a navigation away from set point. Getting leaner is a navigation away from where your body wants to be, which is homeostasis. So that shit doesn't work at all, right? There's no chance that that is going to work for you. So you have, if you want to achieve performance and you want to achieve fat loss, fat loss is best done in the off season, right? So you have season, you tackle performance, you go through post season. When you're in post season, you reestablish a homeostatic balance, reestablish your hormone profile, make sure your HPA axis is in working order, then yes, we can facilitate that fat loss if that's what you desire. Um, and, and you know, again, there's going to be a million people out there that are like, okay, cool. I'll do the fat loss in the off season. Then I'll go back into performance. Just note that you're not becoming a better athlete every year if you're choosing to prioritize fat loss in the off season. Not saying it's a bad thing because it's definitely how you should be doing it. It's just not going to allow you to truly develop your skills and, and develop the capacity you would need to be a better athlete in the subsequent years. Um, as long as you have that understanding, I'm totally good with that setup. And, and again, you know, when we move towards CrossFit for longevity, that's just a fucking oxymoron, man. Like, the, <laughs> there, there's absolutely nobody. Yeah, I was wondering there. where you're going to go with that one. I was like, yeah, yeah, like, it does not seem like it fits. <laughs> Dude, anyone that's done CrossFit can tell you a couple of things. Their shoulders fucking hurt. Their knees fucking hurt. They did a lot of squats, a lot of hinging, a lot of fucking shoulder work. Um, now, I, I think it makes people initially feel a lot better because it does get some weight off people. Um, it definitely gets you in ranges and planes of motion that you weren't previously using. So I do think there's some advantage temporarily. But man, like it, the stress response and the dose response of stress in a CrossFit setting in a high intensity mixed modal setting is not conducive just to living to, to a long age, man. Like, you know, we know studies that show on longevity, you have to have very low stress. You got to get a lot of sleep. And, and that's ultimately how you end up creating success. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't jive with CrossFit, right? CrossFit's intensity, 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 and uh, that just doesn't work. So, so that's really my take on, on nutrition for CrossFit as a whole. Um, now, let's dig into this year's results. Um, I'm going to just address the elephant in the room first and foremost, and I'm going to have a disclaimer and thank God this is being recorded before I get flamed from people in the world, just saying that I'm, I'm like saying things. Um, the one I've been asked about the most is Sarah. Um, and a lot of people know I worked with Sarah for a very brief time when I owned mission six. Um, let me openly say this while it's recorded. I, I 1 million percent believe she is the most talented athlete in CrossFit. She may not have won the games, but I believe she is the most gifted and talented athlete in the world. I just don't think she has run her, her life, 
her training and her fuel appropriately to get to the results that she desires. Now I'll give you some background, right? When we worked together, she was coming off of, I don't fucking know what she did, right? But one of our very first conversations that we had when, when we started working together, I said, can I just tell you what I saw at the games and you can tell me if, if this happened? And she's like, yeah, absolutely. And anybody that knows anything about her knows, um, you know, she has this mode that she calls beast mode, right? She can get halfway through a workout. She can see, hey, Tommy, you're like five reps ahead of me. No, 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 that's not acceptable. It's time to go beast mode and I'm going to kick your ass, right? And she has that. And, and that's, that's just that second gear. But when we look at it from a physiological level, that requires adequate cortisol, right? That's really a cortisol response is all it is. You're digging deep into your fight or flight response. You're creating that deep sympathetic drive and you're able to go to a whole nother level. And we know you can't do that repeatedly day in, day out, um, which is why, again, I think CrossFit borders on excessive intensity unless people are actually telling you how to run your engine. But that's, again, that's another conversation. So I, I said to her, I said, you know, the first year you had beast mode in every workout. You came out of nowhere. No one knew who you were. You got second place. You, you almost won the fucking games, right? Came down to one workout. You almost won the fucking games. I said, I went to the games the next year. I was in California. And every time I watched, I kept waiting for that famous Sarah kick and for that famous beast mode. And, it, and I looked as if you were trying to create it, but your body just wanted nothing to do with it. And, and so in your head, you're like beast mode, but in your body, you were like slow mode. And she literally, bro, she froze. She's like, holy shit, how'd you know that? And I was like, well, it explains absolutely everything that I think is wrong with the way you're approaching your nutrition, which is I think you've underfueled for so long while concurrently overreaching and overtraining that you have destroyed your HPA axis. And that means that we have to rebuild that HPA axis. That means that we have to get you back to caloric maintenance. That means that we have to get you in a position where not only are you fueling and recovering adequately, but that you have fueled and recovered adequately to where your body can then go to those places that you want. Because fueling today's workout is not the answer. Taking time to recover is the answer. And so we got to a point where there was absolutely no, uh, there was like nothing happening, right? And, and she had Dubai coming up. And inside of Dubai, um, you know, I was excited because it was our first time working together, doing something on a big stage. And, and she freaked out. She's like two or three kilos more, which is, I don't know, five to seven pounds more, right? And, and so I was like, it's okay. Like weight doesn't matter. You're not even weighed. And, and so she ended up winning Dubai by like a mile. And I'll never forget because two days after Dubai, she was like, yeah, I got food poisoning the night before. And I lost like four kilos. That's why I won. And I was like, I literally was like, what? I was like, you lost because you had food poisoning. Oh, I was like, come on. Like, and did so you, did she, did she, didn't you say she won? She did win. You think you said you lost because you had food poisoning? No, no, she won. She, she, said, she won. said she won because she had food poisoning. Yeah, yeah. She said she won because she had food poisoning. I lost it. I was like, I don't even know what oh, to say. Okay. Yeah. I was like, man, like, like if that's the mindset, I don't know how I'm going to win to repair metabolism, right? Yeah. And and so, you know, listen, man, like obviously I at that time, um, there was a lot of like miscommunications. I knew she wasn't super thrilled about gaining weight. I also knew it was, you know, not the place she wanted to go. She had mentioned um, another dieting style um, that she had kind of wanted to undertake. And, and, you know, obviously everyone knows like mission six did not, didn't necessarily end well. This isn't the, the right place to have that discussion. And, and so obviously um, she moved away from that and it just kind of ended our working relationship as well. And, and so to my knowledge, she ended up working with, um, a template company. And I can only assume that a low calorie prescription was given because that's, and this is an assumption. It's not what's known. Um, but obviously like we, we move two, three, four years forward and we're continuing to see the same results. And, and it, it honestly breaks my heart. Um, because again, I'm going to go back to, I think she's the most talented athlete in the game. I just think that now at this point, I don't know if the nervous system function based on previous results is ever going to allow the level of performance needed to achieve those level of results. And, and that's, that's a scary thing 
And, and the reason I bring that up is because if you actually look at all the other big names that were expected to make it, I think you're seeing a lot of that. Um, we've had some relatively big names come through our level one, come through NCI and share. Like whenever I start talking about these things, they're like, oh my God, you're speaking my language. And, and again, like, I don't want to talk about, you know, all the different people that have been through it. I don't think it's anybody's fault. I think it's the fact that there is just a lack of appropriate application in this space. And, and that is why NCI is here. That's why we're doing these things. Cause I don't want to see athletes like her, like a great human being like her get hurt. Um, I mean, fuck dude, somebody sent to me yesterday, like on the men's side outside of Matt and Noah, I don't even recognize the other three names, you know, full transparency. I don't keep up with CrossFit a ton anymore. So I don't recognize the names either. Um, yeah. you know, at some point, the names that we know from the days that we were in CrossFit, they have to move on, right? Like, I, yeah. I don't expect Brent Bukowski or, uh, you know, I'm trying to think like, man, who are the, you know, Travis or, or any of those guys to be like winning forever. I mean, at some point age kicks in, man, you know, uh, I can tell you at 36, I just, I don't have what I had at 25. And, and at some point you're just not going to be able to do it. Um, you know, there's, there's like the immortal Sam Briggs who, you know, no matter, I, I feel like she could be a hundred years old and she could still potentially make it to the CrossFit games. Like I, you know, but I, I also think if we looked into her nutritional and recovery habits, I bet she does a pretty good job. Um, you know, that, that would be a guess. I've never, I've never looked at them, but I would guess that she does a very good job. Um, you know, one that I'm really happy to see, uh, bounce back is Brooke Wells. Um, you know, I think there was a time where she really emphasized body composition. And if you look at those two years where there were like pictures coming out where she was shredded and then she massively underperformed at the games. I think now she presents a very aesthetic look. I think she looks great. She has abs. She's not excessively lean and look at her, man. She's performing at a super high level. So I think she's an illustration of what proper fuel and proper recovery can do. Um, you know, I always go back to guys like Ben Smith, you know, Ben Smith was never super ripped. Um, and he always, I believe, overachieved relative to his like genetic potential. You know, um, he was never the strongest. He was never the fastest. But dude was always on the doorstep. And it's because he never ran himself into the ground. Uh, you know, you look at Frazier, you look at Froning. Everyone's like, oh, Froning's so ripped. Like by a bodybuilding standard, if we put him on stage, you could pick him apart, man. Dude's probably 10 to 12 percent body fat. Guy is not sub 10, I don't believe. And if he is, it's like nine right? He carries an appropriate level of body fat for all the performance he does, for, for all the training he does, for all the recovery. So um, I, I think what you're starting to see is, uh, is just life catching up, man. You're starting to see the rigors of the sport year in, year out catching up. And I don't think that the nutritional protocols being used are adequate. I think people are playing the aesthetics game far more than they're playing the performance game. And as we started this podcast out, they are not in any way the same. Like they are different. They have to be treated differently. And like the athlete needs to be made aware of that because let me tell you, the athletes are not supposed to know that it is not an athlete's job to know that if they're hiring a coach, it is not incumbent upon the athlete to know that it is incumbent upon the coach. As a coach, you need to connect early. You need to create that conversation. You need to build that awareness and you need to be ready to move forward with that. Um, you know, those, those are two very different things. And I'm going to remain just staunch on the fact that I think coach has got to step up. Coach has got to be educating. If you're a CrossFit gym owner, you're a coach. If you're coaching a class, you're a coach. You need to be arming yourself with these principles. Don't let people come in your gym where they're coming in your gym and they're wanting to become better. And you're the one that's sitting there like, oh yeah, go eat a banana. Like you don't fucking know anything about your people. Like get them to eat adequately so they can see the goals that they're paying your facility to get. Like it's just fucking human nature, man. It's common sense. That's gotta happen. Um, so I, I think that that's a, that's a touchy subject for me because I've walked in so many gyms and I hear, if I ever walk in a CrossFit gym and I hear a fucking keto challenge, I'm going to lose my shit. <laughs> um, but like, you know, you hear paleo challenges and keto and, and this and that being thrown around those arenas. And it's like, come on, we're better. It's, just, right? it's fascinating to me that despite the physiology, like, there's no debating. And like we said earlier, there's no, there's no gray area there. It's literally human physiology, yet they just don't implement it. Like I, I'm not from the CrossFit space, so I can't really speak to it, but it, it's just kind of mind blowing to see like, the science is there. We know energy systems. We know how it works. Yet we're still choosing to do paleo. Hopefully not a keto challenge. I, I don't think I've seen that in a CrossFit gym. I have seen that. Seen. You have seen it. I've heard of it. Like I haven't been to oh, the gym. I've heard it. It's been oh. brought to MCI. 
Yeah, it's just it's interesting to see because this this there's no debating the science, there's no debating the physiology. So it's just in, interesting is a nice way to put it to see people just continue to go down this road. I mean, in my work with basketball players, fairly recently I saw someone a player DM me asking, "Hey, should I try this diet?" So I read through it. It was literally a paleo diet, and I was like, "Why? Why is a fairly prominent name in the basketball training space?" pushing this out as a way to achieve proper performance. It just does not make any sense. Yeah. And, and, you know, this is where the whole, and, and I mean, dude, we could spend all day on this. This is where the marketing world and the science world will always butt heads because yeah. the truth is not sexy. Right. I, I believe that women, you know, let's look at the top women. Let's look at Tia Toomey. Let's look at Catherine's David's daughter. Let's look at Brooke Wells. Let's look at Sarah. Like, I believe they are far more the exception and not the rule, right? I, I actually believe that Katrin, when she won, well, I don't know if she won once or twice, but she won a couple times. And I think that the, the final time she won, she was bordering on too lean. And I think she struggled to get to that next level again ever since. And I, I would venture to say that year, she overreached so bad that her HPA axis literally was like, nope, like we're not going to that place again. And she just doesn't have that gear. So I don't think she'll win again. Um, I think Tia, it, there's there's a um, there's a CrossFit Games behind the scenes, and it's one of the best lines I've ever heard in one of those. And Tia wakes up and she's she's eating oatmeal and protein. She's like, I'm so sick of fucking eating. And I was like, that's the best thing I've ever heard because it shows me that you genuinely are focusing on adequate fuel and adequate recovery. And yeah. I knew right then and there, I was like, this girl's here to stay. Nobody's gonna beat her. Because not only is she ridiculously gifted and talented, but she understands every facet of the game. And that's why she's so good. But there's so many people that look at Tia, they don't think about the fuel and recovery. And they're like, oh, well, she has super low levels of body fat. Why can't I look like her and perform like her? Listen, she has a genetically low set point. She won the genetic lottery. And, and the reality is the abs and the physique she has are a result of fueling performance, not eating for aesthetics. And that's what people don't want to like, accept. If we can get people to start fueling performance and allowing their body to take shape based on continuing to improve performance, I think we'll have a lot happier like group of CrossFitters. We'll have a much healthier group of CrossFitters. And at the end of the day, I think that CrossFit will continue to evolve positively. I think a lot of the negative press that CrossFit gets is actually not fueled by the modality itself. It's fueled by the misapplication of all the shit that goes into it, right? Yeah. The, the inappropriate uh, mobility routines at like the wrong times, the inappropriate fuel strategies, the lack of focus on recovery, the, the focus on more becoming better. Like, no, that we all know that's bullshit. Like, we all yeah. know it doesn't work. Yet, somebody watching YouTube that sees Rich Froning doing seven workouts a day thinks, oh, I need to do seven workouts a day. I get it. Like, as a media outlet, you want to highlight that. Dude's a beast. I would love to train with him seven times a day. And, and God knows, listen, I think he's way smarter than anybody gives him credit for. If yeah. you ever watch his seven workouts a day, not one time does he go to failure. He actually understands nervous system output probably more than most people give him credit for. And, and the dude knows how to fuel. From my understanding, I, one of my former clients used to train with him. From my understanding, every night he eats a considerable amount of food. And it ain't all clean. Like we're talking donuts, ice cream, like, like dude gets down. Um, yeah. So who knows? It, it's not, he, he's not eating to, to live to be 110 years old. He's eating to fuel his activity, which is to be, you know, at that time was like the best CrossFit athlete in the world. And, and he was, I still think he's the goat. I think in his prime and Matt's prime, I think Rich wins. Um, and, and maybe that's because I'm a Rich Froning fanboy. But, um, but yeah, man, you know, it's, it's been an interesting year. Listen, I, I also want to say this, hats off to CrossFit um, for getting through what they got through. Um, you know, I, I'm not here to talk the politics of, of what was said by Glassman. That was outrageous. It should never been said. Um, the, uh, the actions that apparently been taken in there, I can't support those in any way, but I'll tell you this, man, my hats off to them as an organization, uh, for getting the games format together that they did for keeping it moving, for giving the athletes that depend on the CrossFit games for a livelihood, for, for making a living from their sponsors. Um, 
for giving them an outlet to showcase their hard work, man. My hat is off to the organization. I think they did a great job of that. Same way it is to the NBA, to the NFL, to the MLB, to the MLS, like just finding a way, you know, through the, one of the craziest times ever in the world, man, I, I, I got to give respect where it's due. Um, and, and so, you know, that said, I, I love, I love what they're doing, man. I really do. I, I think that having an online format was great. Uh, getting people to the ranch to compete. I think that's dope. It makes for some very entertaining TV in another week and a half. I can't wait to watch it. Um, and, and, you know, like the, the simple truth is this, man, um, you know, love it or hate it. I don't think the modality is going anywhere. Um, I think it's influenced positively the fitness scene in the world. Uh, I think it has spawned, you know, I think Orange Theory is more successful because of CrossFit. I think F45 is more successful because of CrossFit. Um, I think a lot of trainers have jobs that they actually love because of CrossFit. Uh, it obviously allowed our nutritional principles to really get out to the world. So I got nothing but love, man. Um, I got nothing but love for every single athlete that undertakes it. Um, and so, you know, I think a lot of people, they know, they know I'm never afraid to share my opinion, but I want it to be known very clearly how much respect and how much love and how much admiration I have for each and every athlete that is putting themselves into this arena because I've been around OPEX for a couple of years. I know what it looks like for the Amanda Goodmans of the world, the Danny Nichols of the world, the, the Gabby Andrews of the world, the athletes that not a lot of people may know um, to really put all sacrifice aside and, and to, or, or to put everything aside and make the ultimate sacrifice to be a full-time athlete. I have watched it firsthand, man. I lived in that environment. And, and the sacrifice that they put out uh, to achieve their goals is, is just like any other sport in the world, man. They're some of the most dedicated individuals, and I have massive amounts of love for them. So, um, dude, what did I miss? Because that was 40 minutes of, uh, of craziness. Yeah, I don't think you missed anything. You made up for leaving me hanging for the first four minutes <laughs> with, with, with all that. So I, I appreciate that. But, no, I, I think this was a great episode, and, and I think um, – are you it's in the Facebook group? Like, do we have any comments or questions that we need to answer? I don't know if there's anyone asking questions. Go ahead and look. Uh, uh, we don't have any recent ones about any questions. Okay. Um, not right now. But yeah, if you guys are watching right now in the future episodes, if you guys comment down below, we can see it. So if you have any questions on the topic being covered, uh, definitely feel free to comment down below. And if you're watching on YouTube, go in the Facebook group so you can ask questions while we're live. Yeah, guys, if you're if you're watching on YouTube later, just feel free to comment. We will do our best to answer every single one. Um, if you're interested in any more of the protocols that we discussed, um, if you're interested in being able to implement them for yourself, for your clients, or just literally to learn how to do it the right way, uh, like we said at the very beginning, we do have a level one coming up. It is live streamed on Zoom from the comfort of your own home. Um, and that is a week from Saturday. I believe that's the 24th and 25th. So it'll be Saturday, Sunday. We do go nine to five each day. Um, it, it's, a, it's a special experience, man. And you'll leave with... Uh, you leave with way more knowledge than you ever probably thought possible. And, and you'll be equipped to really start serving this population and every population for that matter. Um, but obviously, you know, the, the performance crowd always holds a, a special place in my heart, man. I was an athlete through and through. I love sports. Uh, I don't really know what to do with myself. Now that the finals are over and Stanley cups over. Shout and, out to Lakers, and, though. That's, that's yeah. Sick. Shout out to the Lakers, man. Shout out to LeBron. Um, dude, but I mean, what a performance in, in that final game that they put on as a team, man, like can't, the Can't craziest thing is all the LeBron haters coming out and now finding any way possible to delegitimize this, like this finals or Come what on. he's done. It's, just, it's Come crazy. Come on, man, he's so good. Like I saw someone on Instagram anything. Not on the point of the podcast, but I saw someone on Instagram that had a whole account. the The name of the account was Daily Three and Six Reminder Three and Six is Finals Record on every like NBA post or Sports Center post that do a comment like. A, entire essay of why LeBron wasn't the GOAT. It's like, how much time do you have to have in your life to go out and just do that? Do you, do you know what, how much talent it takes to take some of the teams that he took to the finals to the finals? <laughs> like the you fact that he got good. there with some of those teams and he lost in like competitive series. Like they've rarely gotten blown out even in that three and six record. Like it, it's insanity, man. Um, but haters are always going to hate. Listen, I'm, uh, <laughs> let's be honest. I've, uh, I've had my fair share over the last couple of years and, and, you know, listen, anytime you bring truth, um, people get butthurt and, you know, yeah. at the end of the day, I'm going to encourage every coach that sees this to continue speaking the truth. Um, even in the face of other people's opinions, because 
that's that's what the world needs. That's how we get this stuff out to the world. It's how we make everything a little bit of a better place. So, um, dude, I, I appreciate the time. Guys, everyone that saw this, I apologize for being five minutes late. Um, I'm actually on vacation this week, as you guys seen, family walking in and out. We're doing this from a hotel room. Um, and so, you know, obviously my goal is to bring you guys value every single week in these episodes and, and really just, you know, share um, – some opinion from the extensive experience I have and, and obviously the knowledge that, that we've been known for. So uh, much love to each and every one of you. I genuinely appreciate your time in viewing this. I hope you have found value. As always, if you're watching on YouTube, do me a favor, subscribe. It means the world to us. If you're watching on Facebook, invite your friends into the Nutrition Coaching Secrets group. Uh, we want that community to continue growing so we can spread the right world. And if you decide that you want to show up for the level one, hit me up directly, guys. Happy to give you a uh, discounted entry in there so that we can bring you into the army of impact and have you continuing to choose impact over everything in your life. Guys, much love. Have an amazing day.